Today, we are back at Max Motive to take a look at this 1933 Chevy C8 Eagle Master. But before getting into all of it, I'm Jay. Welcome to What It's Like. Picture this, you just obtained a car that you know nothing about. It's a car that's off the beaten path, possibly. You wanna know more about it, but you wanna know more about it when the time is right for you, possibly sitting on the bathroom throne. We feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars off the beaten path. We dive in deep, give specs, period correct ads, as well as go in depth with a full in-depth tour and talk about the button switches and knobs. If that sounds of interest to you, subscribe and hit the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. For those that don't know, we have Name That Tune segment at the end of each episode. All you have to do is be the first one to come up with the name of the band as well as song title, and your comment will be pinned to the top of the comment section. Let's talk 1933 Chevy CA Eagle Series. It was only used for one year. It replaced the Chevy BA Series Confederate. The CA was called Eagle early on in its production. Chevy offered a cheaper alternative called the Chevy Standard 6, a.k.a. CC Series, in February of 33, and the Eagle name was changed to Master. So it's really confusing. So if you got an early car, it's an Eagle. If you got a later car, it's a Master. Side note, starting in 1926, GM introduced a short-lived program essentially giving a Junior Series to all of their makes. Their makes included Oakland, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac Junior Series were Pontiac was under Oakland, Viking was under Oldsmobile, Marquette was under Buick, and LaSalle was under Cadillac. Sometime around cancellation, Oakland and Pontiac switched. So Pontiac became part of the five brands offered by GM, which were Chevy, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac. Chevy didn't get a lower priced option until the Standard Six came along in 1933. The 1933 Chevy CA Master Series could be had as a four-door sedan, two-door coach, two-door coupe. Let's stop right there for a second. Does this look like a mini Packard to you? Look at the hood shape, the louvers, the front fenders. I can definitely see the resemblance. Do you in the comment section below? Two-door Cabriolet, two-door sports coupe, two-door town sedan, four-door Phaeton, and the two-door sports roadster. Let's talk specs. Built on the GM A-body platform, it rides a wheelbase of 110 inches. It weighs 2,555 pounds. Price is $580, which is equivalent to you spending $13,295.92 in the year 2022. Total 1933 Chevy production was 486,261 units. Of that number, total Master Eagle Series, 450,435 units. Total Cabriolet was 4,276 units. Moving on to engine. Only one engine on offer. So a little bit of background about this engine. It was introduced in 1929, and it wasn't a V8, but it was a six-cylinder. And, and get this, it was an overhead valve, which was revolutionary. Like, don't get me wrong. Chevy was still doing overhead valve engines before this, but it was with a four cylinder. This is with a six cylinder. While everyone else is doing flathead, Chevy took a different route and ads were saying that this was six for the price of four. The original six was the 194 and it was used in all Chevy cars by 1933, the 194 grew to 207 cubic inch displacement. This engine is referred to as the Stove Bolt 6 or Cast Iron Wonder because they looked old fashioned in design by the day. And it's, it's, really, it's really interesting looking back that the overhead valve design was considered old fashioned when the flathead was the more prominent engine of the day, but that nowadays looks severely old fashioned. Anyway, it's really important to note that this engine uses splash lubrication, meaning oil lubrication isn't under pressure. Some owners called this engine the Babbitt Buster. This engine had two generations. 1929 to 1936 is considered first generation. 1937 to 1963 is considered second generation. In the Brazilian market, 
They offered this engine from 1964 to 1979, so it's crazy to think that this engine was in production until 1979. It's also worth mentioning that the full pressurized oil system wasn't a thing until 1953 with the 235 variant of this engine. 207 cubic inch displacement overhead valve inline six. It produces 65 horsepower, 2800 RPM, 146 foot pounds of torque at 1600 RPM with a bore of 3.3 inches and a stroke of four inches. Compression is 5.2 to one. Has three main bearings wrapped in cast iron. Only one transmission on offer, three speed synchro mesh unit that is a floor mounted unit. So just take a look at this door panel. There is no armrest or door handle to pull the door shut. You could just pull the door shut simply by pulling the door like this, or you could grab onto this and pull it shut. But I would recommend just pulling it shut with the door. Door handle to get out. This is the window crank for the big window. And just notice how the window is all framed out. That's super nice. So just check out how much, how far in the seat sits. In a modern car, the seat would just be right here, but have running boards, exterior running boards to get into this car. Coming down inside the pedal box down here, high beam switches on the floor, clutch, brake, gas, shifter. Here's what over the hood impression looks like. Here's what first person looks like. There is lots of room underneath the steering wheel. The steering wheel is not in your crotch at all. On to the button switches and knobs, starting all the way left, freewheeling. I'm not versed enough to explain how to use or engage or anything about freewheeling. Automated electronics, if you're watching, could you explain to somebody how to use freewheeling that doesn't have a single clue about freewheeling in the comment section below, please. See, I really do read and answer all comments posted. Small black knob is for the lights. Top of the gauge is for the fuel gauge. Bottom of the gauge is for oil pressure. Choke, speedometer in center with odometer at the bottom of that gauge. Ignition below that. Throttle control. Farmers like this feature because it was like a primitive cruise control. Farmers liked it because they, if they were shorthanded, as in the only one on the job that day, he could. No one would ever think about doing this now with the rules and insurance, which were probably put in place because the events that took place that I'm about to tell you, the farmer would put the truck in granny gear and then set the throttle of the truck to drive itself up to like a mile or two per hour. And then the farmer would get in his tractor and shoot hay into the truck, moving in unison down the field. Top gauge is amp meter, bottom is water temperature, another light switch. This is what I look like behind the wheel. There's lots of headroom and it does not feel claustrophobic at all. This is what behind, this is what the rear view looks like out that little window. There's lots of space back here to store stuff. And just look at all of the convertible top workings. This is the motor for the windshield wiper, and there's one wiper there. Notice on the passenger side door, it has a pocket to put stuff into, which is a really nice feature. Down here, this is the emergency brake, handbrake, I should say. Coming to the rear back here, this is for the trunk. These are steps. You step here and step here and back here. This is where the, the rumble seat is. So by opening this, it's a rear seat for the back. It's also a nice place to put stuff back here. This also doubles as sort of a trunk as well as rumble seat. And then this flips out to store an actual trunk on the back of here. All right, moving on to the under the hood section. This is what it looks like under the hood. It's very clean, very straightforward, 
and it just fits in here really nicely. On to the pros and cons. I'm getting all of these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars, Blue Chip Auto Investment, 70 Years from 1930 to 2000 by Richard M. Langworth and the Auto Editors of Consumer Guide. On the positive side, simple to fix, relatively easy to restore, excellent part situation against it. It doesn't rival the early Ford's V8 among enthusiasts. Thus, relatively lower investment potential. They are hard to find, but when you do find them, they are more often over restored. All right, now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to give me the correct name of the band as well as song title will have their comment pinned to the top of the comment section. That one's a little harder. Um, going to give you a hint, it's from the 60s. One of my favorite all-time bands. Uh, anyway, thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me for any reason whatsoever, you could leave a comment in the comment section below. I read and answer all comments posted. The second way is we have a Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. No obligation to join, just simply saying that it's a thing, and the link will be in the description if you're interested. Thank you all so much for the continued support and coming out and watching this. And until next time, toodaloo!